Treatment of mental illness in the United States has taken a turn that does not favor the patient. There are more people with mental illness behind bars than are in hospitals. Women in jail or prison suffer mental illness at much higher rates than men. Prisons and jails have become the norm for housing those with mental illness. Why? Grab your pen and paper. You may want to take a note. I come from a big family. I'm the oldest of six. To me, being the first person to go to college, it's like setting a standard, you know? My little brother is eight years old now. I challenge his curiosity. I challenge him to dream. I have to paint a picture for him that he can look up to and live up to and possibly be better than. My name is Jacquez, and I am your dividend. Hello and welcome to the Clarion Call Show. I'm Janice Hatcher Liggins, your host. In the 1840s, the United States criminalized mental health as a regular practice, putting mentally ill persons in prison by the thousands. After a hundred years of improvement, where do we stand today? Today, we take a closer look at mental health and the correction system to gain insight into where we are with mental health today. Joining us to give subject matter insight is Dr. Bolina Shaw, board certified child, adolescent, and adult community psychiatrist, recently assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and medical director at an outpatient mental health center in Prince George's County. Also joining us is former Deputy Secretary, Maryland Department of Public Safety, and President of the France Group, Mr. Wendell France. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate you joining us to talk about this, I think, very uh, sensitive subject, and that's the mentally ill and combined with the correction system. So you as a psychiatrist and you as former Deputy Secretary for Public Safety, I think can uh, add a lot of value to the conversation. And when we talk about mentally ill, most people, I usually think of people who talk to themselves or hear voices, but not necessarily. What does a person with mental illness, what does that mean? So that can be a very broad term. So the most common term about what, a mental, what mental illness is, is someone who is affected in their thoughts, behaviors, or feelings, and, that, and it's created some type of imp impairment to their own function. And so that can be something as common as depression, which is the number one cause of morbidity in the world, according really? to the World Health Organization, that just because of the inability to work and function from a day-to-day -day standpoint, depression is actually the most common cause of morbidity in the world. Mm. And then there are the more serious mental illness conditions like schizophrenia or psychosis that you would speak of that are more noticeable and, and have, I think, more stigma as well. Wow. Well, the, um, do you find that mental illness affects women more than men or men more than women or is it an equal opportunity um, situation? It depends on the condition. So a, depres a depression, for example, affects women more commonly, although there are some statistics that say that men may have more difficulty getting out of a depressive episode over time mm. than an illness like alcoholism or people who su suffer from problems with alcohol. They actually are more likely to be a man. However, major mental illness like schizophrenia, even though that may come on, the onset may be a little bit earlier for <coughs> um, males, that it still actually affects men and women equally. And you are a community psychiatrist. Um, what does that mean and how does it uh, differ from what a regular, I think of a psychiatrist, you're laying on the sofa in their office, mm -hmm. but that's not what you do. So what is a 
community psychiatrist, or how is it different? And let me actually also talk about what a psychiatrist is, because <laughs> yeah. a lot of people wonder, you know, are you a psychologist or yeah. are you a counselor and, and things of that nature. So a psychiatrist is someone who has gone to medical school and completed all the prerequisites. So I delivered babies and scrubbed in on surgeries just like every other doctor. And then as opposed to taking the path of, say, an internal medicine doctor, I chose to be a psychiatrist, someone who specializes in mental health. So a psychologist is one who has a similar set of training in some areas, but their treatment and um, assessment it can be a little bit different as far as testing and things of that nature, but a lot of great psychologists have helped in aspects of my training, but a lot of people have questions about what's a psychiatrist versus a psychologist. I know one of the differences is the psychiatrist can actually prescribe medications. Exactly, okay. because we have gone through, through medical school, so we've had that medical background and training. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, in most states, only psychiatrists can prescribe medications, and that's the most common differentiating, fa differentiating factor that a lot of people consider. So as a community psychiatrist, how do people come in contact with you? So, so a community psychiatrist, I think one of the common definitions or, or concepts is that we provide a, a greater degree of support for people. So we can have, we work in teams, so we can have a person who will help maybe with vocational support, housing support, <coughs> other case management needs, therapy, and we work to help coordinate and direct that team and provide the medication piece as well as what other uh, guidance that is needed for the team. And so sometimes as communi psych community psychiatrists, we will go out and we'll be in the field. In my last job, I had the opportunity to go into the field of, in Baltimore City and I was at schools and homes able to see children where they had needs and help families who had problems interfacing with the traditional system mm -hmm. and that they weren't able to consistently make appointments and come into the office regularly and then they would often be hospitalized or go into higher levels of care, even sometimes actually be arrested depending on their mental health conditions. And so we could actually help them by, by doing a little bit more, being a little bit more intensive than that doctor that Ha that sees people um, that may be well enough to have that hour-long visit on the couch once a week for, for a oh, while. That's awesome. So that's awesome. Especially when you're talking about going into their homes. Yes. That's yes. awesome. It's a great way to see how how people live, what their needs are, and, and how we can also use the existing supports in their community as well from you know just going to the house a couple times and realizing that there is a neighbor that's always there supportive and then starting to learn how can I use that neighbor to help make sure that this, this child or family is going to be as functional as possible. So I really enjoyed being out to, in the field as a community psychiatrist in that way. Not all jobs do you have, the, in not all jobs do you have the ability to do that. Sometimes mm -hmm. you are back in the office at a desk, um, but I still like to make sure that I'm interfacing with teams and, and finding all those other additional areas of support that people may need in the community. And for the average person, if you look at uh, some of the conditions that people have to exist in just mm -hmm. day to day, um, let's like say homelessness, mm -hmm. for someone who's mentally ill and also um, homeless, that's a whole different level of challenges that they have to face. And, uh, and unfortunately, 22% of homeless individuals have some type of a mental illness. So are you able to see that uh, the homelessness have any more of an impact than anything else? There, there are several things that face an individual that can impact that, but. Um, so I like to think of it this way. So if t today I lose my job, then I, I have, uh, the, I'm unable to pay my rent or my mortgage, then I'm gonna go stay with my mama, right? Uh -huh. You know, I'm or then I'm gonna find my best friend, or I'm gonna couch surf for, a, for a while until I can get myself back on my feet. Mm -hmm. And so, and it takes a while to get there where you're actually living on the streets. For most people, we have enough supports, we have a, enough that we can, we don't, being homeless take is a process, if you will. Mm. And so for some people, you know, if you are, are unable to stay in someone's home, you're not showering, you're hearing voices, you're creating disturbances, um, you have significant problems with drugs or alcohol that create an environment where they don't feel like they want you to stay in their home, then some people then end up being homeless. So the options diminish. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I think that's a, a big part about with this association with homelessness is that substance abuse and or mental health conditions can often contribute to homelessness and then when you have problems with substance abuse or mental health concerns that you don't have the same functionality and capability to be able to call around mm -hmm. and 
find the next the next shelter or find that transitional housing program, stick it through in, 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 in those processes, because it's actually really hard to find a lot of support sometimes. And so, especially if you don't have someone in, in a community mental health center or a community psychiatry team that can help you with the case management. So, so it's a, it really ends up being um, a catch-22 that you end up having some condition that may lead to, to home homelessness and then that condition helps, prevents you from being able to access all the services that might be available. Mm -hmm. And when it relates to being out, uh, having mental illness and coming into contact with the police, for example, um, I saw a report that indicated that uh, one in four of all police fatalities are a person that had a mental um, health challenge, it, which means that if they could have treatment, community-based uh, psychiatry, for example, they may b have a better option for surviving that or not getting involved in that. Have you, what do you think about that, Pete? You're, you're, you've been a police and well, so forth, but. <laughs> I, I do believe that um, most of the challenges that we face in our systems in some way have a direct correlation to mental health. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Not just mental illness, but mental health and where that person is when he presents himself to that situation and at an uh, immediate in incident. <clears throat> and so we see folks coming into contact with law enforcement who have significant mental health challenges but the resources that the officers often have are not adequate enough mm. to deal with it because it requires that a, that a police officer really have some of the same kind of training that Dr. Shaw has, and that's just not the situation mm -hmm. that we're in. Mm -hmm. And so police officers have to make a rapid decision about how to not only approach this situation, <clears throat> how do you de-escalate de it, and then how do you move that person to some place where he or she is sustained and can get help. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the situation moves so rapidly that um, once the person is ultimately taken into custody, then you have to hand that person off and their issues mm -hmm. to the local detention center or the, or the local jails for them to now manage that person during the process that they go through to adjudicate whatever it was that they were involved in and that got the officers involved at first. Police officers don't have the ability in most cases to make those finite decisions about mm -hmm. assessing the individual and then getting them into a, a, a care uh, environment that often falls you know falls into place after the person has been taken into custody but they present <clears throat> significant challenges as it relates to risk and safety um, to police officers law enforcement officers on the initial intake because families often don't know the degree to which this person uh, mm -hmm. is ill or to the level of what uh, that they be, can become violent or whether they are uh, able to understand the fact that you're being taken into custody for some sort of infraction and whether they, they become compliant with the officer's request. So it's very difficult, very tense, and very dangerous situations oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier people involving uh, using drugs and so forth. Is that what's called a dual diagnosis if they have a mental challenge and the complications. That is one one um, consideration of a dual diagnosis. Okay. There are often a lot of other um, mental or physical health comorbidities that that they're less lo likely to be called the classic dual di diagnosis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But oftentimes, substance abuse um, as well as mental health do play play a role in um, feeding off of each other. And as far as seeking treatment, what do people generally? Um, seek treatment or put it off? What have you found? That are, they, are they more apt to seek treatment on their own or are they more apt to just pretend they're okay? Well, I think talking about stigma actually, and, and just to go back a little bit to the past question as well about the police fatalities, I think that a big piece of that is also stigma, that there's a lot of stigma about those with mental health, that they're dangerous or they're inherently dangerous. And then although there are some people who have mental health conditions who do present dangerously, they're more likely to be actually a victim of violence because of the vulnerability of, due to the mental illness. Mm. And so I do think that in the same way that we have some racial and ethnic groups such as African Americans that are perceived from a stigma standpoint to be more violent, um, and that's just an implicit bias that we have in our, in our country, that I think that we have the same feeling about those with mental illness and therefore they're at higher risk of being 
being a victim. So along those same lines, there's a huge degree of stigma within the, the within someone who has a mental health condition. There's self-stigma, the, the taking on the view, the negative view about mental health and putting it back on yourself. And therefore, you don't go seek treatment because that's for people who are crazy. That's for people mm. who can't fix their problem. That's for people whose substance abuse is out of control and I'm not there yet. And so stigma is a, a very important um, player in this as far as seeking treatment as well as how what happens after people do interface with either a crisis situation such as the the, pol the police or whether or not a, a traditional outpatient treatment center. Very good, very good. Oh, stick tight, we'll come right back, okay? So what is the situation now? Comparing numbers of the mentally ill in our communities versus prisons. How do mentally ill fare with the police? That's next. Stay with us. You make me wear my bike helmet. You taught me never to run with scissors. You tell me to stay away from drugs. To always buckle my seatbelt. And to follow the swimming rules. You're always looking out for me and trying to keep me safe. So why do you keep a loaded gun in your drawer? Here in the garage. Closet. Shoe box under the bed. Where anyone can get to it. How safe is that? How safe is that? How safe is that? You ask them to follow some safety rules. Now they're asking you. In fact, they're counting on you. Never let your gun get into the wrong hands. If you own a firearm and are not using it, please be responsible and be sure that it's stored in a safe place. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. did prisons become the acceptable place for mental health treatment over hospitals? How do those with mental health fare when they have encounters with police? What reforms are needed? With us again is Dr. Bolina Shaw and Mr. Wendell France. So in the 1840s, um, the United States did a wide-scale criminalization of the mentally uh, challenged and with thousands in prisons. And a lady by the name of Dorothea Dix um, brought attention to that, which brought major reforms to for more humane treatment. That went well for years, hundreds of years, or at least a hundred years, I should say. But around the, 18, the 1960s, we began to see a change. And um, with um, more and more people beginning to go back to prison. What do you think led to that? Well, I, I do think that in the 1950s there was the invention of a medication to help tr to treat psychosis. And prior to that, we didn't have any specific medication for the symptoms of one hearing voices or seeing things that aren't there or having significant disorganization in their behavior so that they're maybe not moving and stiff like a board for a while or not able to eat or shower. Mm -hmm. That there could be multiple problems with that more severe mental illness like schizophrenia. And there was a medication that now is, was available to us, and I, and I think that we got very excited and, and thought that, you know, even though there, we, were, we had done well in decriminalizing mental illness, still our, our institutions were still institutions. That if people had a goal in life or had the ability, they didn't, or, they, or where they wanted to be back with their families, they weren't really able. Mm. And so the goal was then to reintroduce people into society and reintroduce them back out of the institutions. However, we didn't have a commensurate increase in community-based services to make sure that people had all of the supports that they needed because, as we know, medication is just one piece of treatment for people with mental health conditions. So what we have begun to see uh, in the in 1955, for example, there were 5,000, there were over a half million beds 
available to those with mental illness. Uh, today, there's instead of a half million, there's only like 37,000 beds in hospitals versus the prisons. So the rate of the, the, the diminishing rate of beds in hospitals has just dropped tremendously, but the beds in prisons for the mentally ill has shot up dr drastically. Yet, you know, Mr. France, well, well, how are they able to, comp to handle these people well, in prisons? Let's be realistic. There was no <laughs> uh, desire to increase um, prison beds with mental health or patients who were in need of mental health services. That was a sort of a byproduct of, in Maryland, us closing uh, major mental health facilities and uh, now you have to find places for folks who now commit violations or break the law in a sentence to be housed. And so local detention centers and, and jails became inundated with um, people who uh, ordinarily would have been moved to some mental health facility, uh, but there were none. Mm -hmm. And so upwards of 40 percent of uh, some populations in local jails and in prisons are, are, are people who have mental health issues, acute, chronic, depression, uh, dual diagnosed, and they're just a whole range of people who are inside the walls of prisons and jails who uh, were it not for their current mental health situation, their mental health challenge, would ordinarily be back in society because the crime wouldn't have been committed in most cases mm -hmm. or they would not have been, they would not decompensate because they're not compliant with taking medications. And so we find ourselves, particularly in Maryland, trying to um, effectively manage that population, provide them with the services they need while they're within uh, the confines of the state correction system and then move them towards some sort of discharge plan that connects them back to a community mental health provider. Uh, but there are just not a, a lot of those. There's just not enough of those throughout the state. And so that's the conversation that uh, needs to be had. Um, we look at creating specialized units, behavior management units, special needs units uh, who, who try to deal with an inmate's behavior that may be a subset of the mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and so it becomes a, a real challenge, but um, there are just not enough resources, at, at least that it was my experience when I was there, to try to make sure that you provide it adequately for all those people that you have to deal with and the different levels of people mm -hmm. who are in different stages of either their treatment or their episodes. In the system, in the prison system, are they um, segregated? those that have a mental illness f from the general body, or does it depend on what their illness is? Well, th there, there are different levels, mm -hmm. and, and, and Dr. Shaw may be able to explain this a little better than I can. There are folks who have, um, that are, are not chronically me mentally ill, mm -hmm. um, so they should be able to uh, be sustained within the population of a correction facility at some level. Uh, if they reach a certain uh, uh, assessment, uh, where they can't be housed with the rest of the population, then the options are either to have them move to uh, the Patuxent Institute, which is the state facility, the state corrections facility for those who have mental health illnesses, or to some other uh, facility based on their conduct, like Clifton T. Perkins. But the, you got to remember, um, the, if you look at the number of people who are in need of mental health uh, services, and the number of beds that are actually available, uh, you have to kind of have those people within the confines of the, of the uh, various prisons in some housing that's uh, designed for special needs or mm -hmm. behavior management or um, uh, mental health uh, issues away from the general population. You had indicated earlier when we were talking about the police that police are not trained to really handle and understand how to handle those who are mentally um, challenged, not like a psychiatrist would right. be. What's the situation once they're inside the prison? Are they specially trained? If you're not in a facility that's just for mental health, if they're in with the regular population in a regular prison, how are they able to handle, or do they, well, are they we, able we, to handle? The, the state system has tried to ensure 
that folks who work with mentally ill people, particularly in certain types of units, have an understanding of where they are and who they're working with. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't always work out um, that every day you have the right officer in the right place, but for the most part, you try to make sure that if you're working in one of these units that you've had some additional training, that you understand uh, your relationship with the team, because normally there are teams of psychiatrists, psychologists, or, and other and nurses who work with these folks, and so that you understand uh, what the team's goals and mission is as relates to that patient, and that you view them differently than you would in, a, in, a, in, a other, in other environments. And so while they may not have gone to school to become degreed in these various disciplines, there are opportunities, and we've tried to make sure, at least during the period I was there, that folks understood where they were working and that you don't just take a person who has no familiarity with uh, this type of housing, you know, this mm -hmm. type of individual and place them in that environment. Okay. So um, let's assume that they are ready to get come home. What kind of um, uh, reforms or at least what kind of facilities already exist that, that you may be aware of in Maryland, for example, that are ready to house them or take them in, if not house them, at least provide treatment similar to what you're doing? So one challenge is that there isn't, and depends on the jurisdiction, but there often is a breakdown between the release from a correctional, a correctional institution back into the community. So sometimes when I would be doing work in the emergency room, I'd have people stopping through, and their chief complaint is not necessarily that I'm hearing voices or I'm depressed, but I just got out of jail and I don't have a place to go. I just got out of jail. I was on medicine yesterday, but I don't have medicines mm. with me today, or I don't have insurance at this moment, and, and just basically how to help navigate the system. And so that is that is a challenge sometimes that, that people do face is that there aren't, there isn't always the, the connection back in every, from, from every facility back into the community to make sure that that treatment that they were receiving previously was, was continued. Another big issue as well in the substance abuse world is that, say if someone has a history of heroin dependence uh, or some type of opioid dependence, that they have been abstinent from that drug in the facility, and then upon release, then they go back and use, but then their tolerance wasn't the same, and actually some people could, and often do die, mm -hmm. because they, they re-enter without, um, you know, trying to go back and use at the same degree that their of their habit previous wow. uh, previously, and so another big piece is also substance abuse treatment, um, and and you talk about rehab facilities or things of that nature, um, and getting people back into substance abuse treatment. And I do think we do a better job oftentimes with the substance abuse treatment and halfway houses and things of that nature coming, especially if there's a drug related charge. But um, but there is still I think a lot of room to grow to grow in that area. And there's something called the uh, the court, the uh, mental health court. Have what is that? Have you heard of well, it? Well, in Baltimore, there were there's a mental health court, and it's centered around um, ensuring that uh, the person doesn't end up mm. in jail. Uh, that that it's focused towards treatment um, and getting getting the individual back into some environment where he can he or she can work towards sustain themselves in the community as opposed to being uh, rearrested, incarcerated, and bringing all the of those revolve issues. indoors. Correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's, there are, to my knowledge, resources in Baltimore to help with that, with the mental health court. Lots more reform. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're going to draw it to a close. It appears we are returning to the practice of early 19th centuries and incarcerating the mentally ill, at least with numbers higher than we've had a year, 100 years ago. We must support mental health reforms with assisted outpatient treatment and mental health courts. We must also hold mental health officials responsible for outcomes. People with mental health challenges need someone else to advocate for them. Jails and prisons are not necessarily the best option. You want to lend support? Contact us today to let us know. That's it for now. We hope you enjoyed the show. Join us next time, won't you, for the Clarion Call. Until then, I'm Janice Liggins. Blessings to you.